Good morning and welcome to Worksheet Cloud, Grade 6 Natural Sciences. My name is Mrs. Hall and I look forward to teaching you about different ecosystems today. I just want to remind you that if you have a question during the lesson, please feel welcome to send an email with your question to grade6 at worksheetcloud.com. Let's get started. Wow, I really do miss walking into my classroom and being greeted by my happy class every morning. I miss laughing with them and watching their beautiful little faces light up while we discuss our plans for the day. Especially the plans like a hot chocolate break or a Nutella sandwich day. If any one of them are watching now, they know exactly what I mean. Those were the days. Let's hope that this lockdown ends soon and we can all get back to normal. So let's get started on ecosystems. Just remember, if you've been taught this lesson by your amazing teacher already at your own school, please feel free to use it as a recap and consolidation lesson. You never know, you might just learn something new. Today's lesson is on ecosystems, relationships between living and non-living things, and adaptations. First of all, what is an ecosystem? The simplest definition of an ecosystem is that it is a community or group of living organisms that live in and interact with each other in a specific environment. For instance, the African bushveld is an ecosystem made up of living things such as trees, plants, animals, insects, and microorganisms that are in constant interaction between themselves. These living things also depend on non-living things. The natural environment would include things like water, soil, and air. These are known as non-living or abiotic factors. Living things in the ecosystem are known as biotic factors. Living and non-living things depend on each other to survive in an ecosystem. An ecosystem can be a small place where an organism lives to a huge place such as the wilds of Africa. Some scientists even consider the entire planet as an ecosystem. Where does an ecosystem get its energy source from? Well, the sun provides the primary energy of an ecosystem. It enters into the system through the process of photosynthesis in plants. Photosynthesis is a process where plants make their own food. Remember this concept? Your teachers would have taught it to you right at the beginning of the year. Perhaps you need to jump up and down and shake up those brain cells, grade sixes. Without photosynthesis, the plants would not be able to produce food for the animals in the ecosystem. Are you with me? Are you on track? Now let's get back to different kinds of ecosystems. How do these relationships work between the living and non-living things? Let's take a closer look. Firstly, living things, as I said before, are called biotic factors and include things like animals and plants. Non-living things, or abiotic factors, include things like water, sun and air, and the soil. There are many different kinds of ecosystems. Some of them are rivers, mountains, grasslands, deserts, and even a little pond can be an ecosystem. The conditions in these ecosystems are very different, such as the amount of light shining in or the amount of water that is available. The conditions determine which kind of animals or plants will live here. Let's take a closer look at the animals living in these two ecosystems. 
Over here, we have a mountain ecosystem. And if you look very closely, we have living and non-living things. The living things would be the animals, such as the buck over here, the falcon over here, the lizard over here, and over here, and the birds. The non-living things would be things like the rock, the soil, the mountain, the air, the temperature. Right. And all of these things depend on each other and interact with each other in order to survive. A pond ecosystem is the same. It has its own plants and animals that rely on each other to survive. We have, for example, a mosquito, we have a duck, we have frogs, we have fish, and then we have plants, water plants in the pond as well. These are all living things. The non-living things would be the water and the soil and the air and the temperature surrounding the pond. What is an adaptation, grade sixes? An adaptation is a special skill which helps an animal or a plant to survive and do everything it needs to do. Adaptations could be physical, and we're going to delve into this in quite a bit more detail in the next few slides. Physical changes to the animal's body or behavioral changes in how an individual, animal, or a society do things in their everyday life. Physical adaptations. These are special body parts that help a plant or even an animal survive in its environment. Camouflage is the first adaptation we're going to look at. It is a physical adaptation that allows animals to blend in with their surroundings. Camouflage lets an animal hide from predators or even allows it to sneak up on its prey. Can you see the lizard, the lizard, sorry, la, um, hiding on this log? Very difficult to see. Take a closer look. This physical ad adaptation is called camouflage. Have you ever copied what someone else is saying? We all like to do that now and again. That can be quite annoying, though, for the person that came up with it. But some animals use copying as a way to survive. Mimicry is a type of physical adaptation in which a plant or an animal looks a lot like another animal or even an object. Animals that use mimicry are the ultimate copycats. Look at this example of the dead leaf mantis. It is a striking example of mimicry. It imitates dead, broken, and decaying leaves, both in color and in form. Leaf patterns, if you look very closely over here, adorn the wings. The dead leaf mantis also behaves differently and mimics the motion of dead leaves. If bothered, the mantis sways, sways like a leaf. So not only does it have a physical adaptation, it also has a behavioral adaptation. Any action a plant or animal takes to survive in an environment is called a behavioral adaptation. It's easy to remember that behavioral adaptations are about the actions that you have. Because the word behave is right there in the name. And behave is a word about how we act. And a little bit of emotional, a little bit of an emoji here, tongue in cheek. Um, how many of you are behaving right now while I'm doing this lesson? I hope you're all sitting up straight and staying focused. Here's a good example of a behavioral adaptation. A Venus flytrap plant snaps shut to capture an insect meal, which they then digest to get the nutrition 
it needs. How cool is this while I was doing my research for this lesson? When the woolly bat is looking for a resting place, it snuggles up inside a pitcher's plant's trap. The bat gets a place to sleep over here. You can see it. And its poop gives the pitcher plant much needed nutrients. This is such a good deal that the plant grows two kinds of pitchers. One for nagging hugs and one for poop. The first kind, which sprouts closer to the ground, is perfumed and slippery and full of delicious digestive fluid, which it makes which makes it perfect for catching and eating bugs. The other type grows higher up on the pitcher plant and is more like a cozy ho hotel room for the woolly bats. Now, an adaptation can also be a behavioral, a behavioral adaptation affecting the way an organism acts. An example of a structural adaptation is the way that some plants have adapted to life in the desert. So we are now going to take a look at a desert ecosystem and the adaptations within those plants and animals that live there. Now remember grade sixes, deserts are dry, hot places. Let's take a look at some specific adaptations for the plants and animals that live there. And because I've been talking so much, I think I'm going to have a little sip of water. Otherwise, I confuse my words and I don't always get out what I'm trying to say. <laughs> and I make silly mistakes while I'm talking. Right, I want to take a look at this desert plant. It's called a Valvichkia. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Valvichkia plants have very long roots that grow deep into the ground. This is to absorb water below the ground because obviously there isn't a lot of water in the desert. This plant is adapted to its environment and knows that if it wants to survive in the desert, that this is what it needs to do. It is known locally as ntombo or onion of the desert. Valvichkia is used for food by humans as well, springbuck, rhinoceros, elephants and zebra. A number of animals feed and obtain shelter from this plant, which provides a cool green oasis in the desert. Take a good look at the leaves and how they are structurally adapted to provide that shelter or coolness to little animals or insects living in the desert. We can't really see the roots, but I'm pretty sure that it would be quite difficult to dig this plant up. Ah, oh, one of my favorites. I had to include this in my presentation. Desert meerkats. Meerkats are specially adapted to living in the harsh desert environment. They have dark patches around their eyes. Take a close look here at this little baby one over here, as well as the adult ones over here. This helps them be effective lookouts by reducing the glare of the sun, much like a baseball player who paints dark lines beneath his eyes. Their eyes also allow them to take in a wide angle view of the scene. This helps prevent predators from gaining an advantage and sneaking up on them. Meerkats also possess special adaptations to help them burrow. Their eyes have a clear protective membrane that shields them from the dirt while digging. Their ears are also closed tightly to keep the, 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 the soil out. The dirt. Meerkats have light brown fur, we look over here, with a grey and brown tint to it, with stripes on their back. You can see them quite clearly over here. Their dark skin bellies are covered with only a thin layer of fur, 
allowing the meerkats to warm themselves by, li by lying face up in the sun. Aren't they just too gorgeous for words? Cute little thing. Ah, the desert jackal. I also had to include this one in my presentation. And you can you see I love dogs. And you're going to understand why I use the desert jackal in this presentation. Because I have a little Jack Russell at home called Charlie. And he's been very naughty while I've been trying to give these lessons and record them. Sometimes, now and again, you might hear him barking in the background. But that's why I chose to talk to you about the jackal today and the jackal's adaptation to surviving in the desert ecosystem. They are a type of canine, just like a dog. And they are related to dogs and wolves. They look like a cross between a German Shepherd and a Fox. They have the Fox's small little face. If you look over there quite closely, you can see it. Delicate legs and a fluffy tail with the German Shepherd's long alert ears. Now, can you see the German Shepherd here? And the Fox over here. Golden Jackals find a mate for life. The two jackals have pups together for about eight years. The young jackal, jackals are born in a den, which is in the parents' territory. So they live with their parents for up to eight years. The pups are nursed for up to eight weeks. When they are weaned, that means when they stop drinking their mom's milk, they start eating regurgitated food. Male and female mates live together for their entire lives and raise their young together. Isn't that special? Jackals do not live in packs. Jackals survive in the wild at uh, probably close to almost 15 years. In the winter, it gets colder and the jackal grows a thick coat of hair in preparation for this season. The jackal has also adapted to eating insects where there is not much, when there is not much prey around. And when they can't find water, they lick the condensed water from the fog of stones in the early morning. Quite a lot of interesting facts about the desert jackal. I learned a lot too while doing the research for this lesson. Great Sixers, we've come to the end of our lesson. Thank you so much for watching and paying attention and listening carefully to my information that I was trying to give you. Just remember, this lesson was brought to you by Worksheet Cloud. You are so welcome to go online now and get the worksheet and download it and print it out, as well as the memo. Now, Grade Sixes, the worksheet that relates to this lesson that I taught you today has a little bit about food webs in it as well. So tomorrow, when I'm doing food webs, you will be able to answer all the questions on the worksheet. So don't worry about it too much now if you don't get through the whole worksheet today. Tomorrow's lesson will cover quite a few of the questions on food webs, and then I will have another activity sheet for you tomorrow that will also be based on ecosystems as well as food webs. Grade sixes, enjoy the rest of your day. Remember, help your mom around the house. It's not easy for mom and dad to be doing all the work by themselves. You can't just be watching Netflix or playing on your computer. Have a great day. And I look forward to seeing you tomorrow.